because you're a chairman of the RNC, uh, we were wondering if you could walk us through your favorite day as the chairman and then your most challenging day as chairman. That's a very, very good question. In 1984, uh, we, we knew that we were going to win the election. I mean, after the final debate uh, where the president looked at Walter Mondale and said, I'm not going to take advantage of the relative youth and inexperience of my opponent. That's when the papers were saying he's too old to be president. He, he rebounded. We decided in the final day of the campaign, the president was going to fly from Washington to the ranch in Santa, in Santa Barbara. And we had scheduled a stop in Minneapolis, St. Paul which of course was Mondale State, he was from Minnesota. And uh, Ed Rollins, whose pictures right over there, uh, who was the campaign chairman, and I decided, well, we're going to win this thing, let's just have the president skip the rally and go on out. Well, of course what happened is he lost uh, Minnesota by 2,500 votes. But after we won that, the president asked me to come over and said, why don't you finish this out with me? I, th I thought your term was the same as my term, and I said, no, Mr. President, son. He said, well, you know, we did really well. Why don't you finish it out with me? And that changed my plans, my life, my, my family's plans, and we ended up uh, staying for the remaining four years uh, of his presidency. And that was, that was really a, a wonderful, uh, you know, a wonderful moment uh, for us and for our family. And uh, when the President of the United States, you know, in effect says, hey, you did a good job, I want, I want, I want to keep you on, That's, that, was a, that was a pretty good day. The, the, the worst day as chairman, now that, that's a really, really interesting question. I mean, it wasn't really so much uh, a disaster sort of thing. It was sort of an embarrassment for me. And it happened in the first week I was chairman. Broder asked me what sounded like an innocuous question. So, well, Mr. Chairman, if you had your choice, when would you like President Reagan to announce whether he's going to run for re-election or not? Okay. And I said, well, you know, uh, David, if I had my choice, I would really like him to announce, you know, maybe no later than September of this year, which would be a year ahead of time. It would give us a year to get our ground game together, our voter identification and registration and all the rest of that. Very innocuous, okay? Uh, the next morning, I'm in the car, uh, being driven to work, and I open the Washington Post. <laughs> and there's David Broder's comment saying, new Republican chairman wants Reagan to announce whether he'll run in se September. I, I, oh my God, that's... The next thing I know, my phone in the car rings, and it's James Baker III, the White House Chief of Staff. <laughs> and Jim said, uh, Frankie? <laughs> he said, um, you know, you've only been on the job for a couple of days, but let me tell you something. The White House will decide when President Reagan will announce or won't announce whether he'll run for re-election. Uh, we don't like uh, national chairman or other people uh, trying to indicate what the date was. I said, Jim, all right, all right, I understand, I understand. So that was, that was a tough day <laughs> when I got to the office. <laughs> I never forgot that. I mean, any time I was asked anything about the president, you know, I always kept thinking, I right, know what's the White, the White House determines that kind of message, and you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. So Going off that a little bit, yeah. um, when you were chairman, what was the relationship more generally between the RNC and Republican political leaders? And, and since you've left the position, how do you think that relationship has changed? That's a very good question because it's like night and day. Um, we would, every Tuesday, when the president was uh, in Washington, we would have a meeting in the Capitol. What we were doing is saying, what's going to happen in the next week? Is there going to be, is the president going to be making make a major speech on something? Is there going to be a major vote uh, in the House or in the Senate? How are we going to handle it? Uh, if it had something to do with what was going on abroad, we would have an ambassador there or someone from the Pentagon who would explain. And what was fundamentally that we were working out the strategy to handle whatever it was going to be. Now, normally what I would do is I would then go back to the RNC and I would immediately get, now this is before social media, so we didn't have, you know, couldn't just go back and push a button and communicate. 
uh, we would go back and my team would be putting together talking points for someone who might go on a radio show, op-eds, uh, longer documentation that could be put out, and I would send that through faxes to all the members of the Republican National Committee and Republican leaders all over the United States. So that, let's assume uh, a vote was taken in the House or Senate, immediately thereafter, the, they would go letters to the editor, op-eds, and, and people would go and talk to, to spread the message. I mean, co communicate the message. I mean, it's done differently today with, 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 with social media. And so we were, we were very involved in, and as chairman, I was very involved with the leaders of the party uh, in the House and in the Senate, and uh, uh, clearly at the White House. And I would say also that there's a big difference, too, in the job, in both whether you're chairman of the Republican National Committee or Democratic National Committee, if you control the White House. It, it, the job is just really different. When, when you don't control the White House, you know, the Republican National Committee, along with whoever the, you, the leaders are in the House and Senate, are really the main people. But when you control the White House, the White House you know, it, 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 you know, determines where you're going uh, with, uh, uh, with policy. I think the thing that changed the role of both of the two major political parties to the worst, in my view, was the McCain-Feingold bill on campaign reform. Because what it did, when you really thought about it, the two broadest special interest groups in the country were the Republican Party, and you had moderate leftish Republicans, most a lot of them from New England, and you had conservatives and you had people in the middle. The Democratic Party also had a right, left, and a middle. The middle for the Democrats was called Blue Dog Democrats. They were more conservative Democrats, mostly from the South. So both parties had a center. And uh, what, what happened with uh, McCain-Feingold, the intent was good. The intent was to prevent big money from having an over-influence in, in the races. And I mean, I had talks with Senator McCain at the time. I thought he was making, I was out, I wasn't chairman anymore. But money in politics is a lot like water. It tends to find its way <laughs> down. You know, you can't stop water. It, it'll find its way down. I've always been in the view that the best way is, is full disclosure and transparency. If you're running for office and I run a sawmill in your district and I give you $200,000 and you're a voter, you're going to say, hmm. Why did the sawmill guy give our candidate 200? There's got to be something more here. Raises some questions. The media can, you know what I'm saying? You determine. Right now, the result of, of McCain-Feingold is the creation and, and some of the other cases that have followed uh, of these non-responsive special interest PACs, some of which you don't even have to reveal who's giving the money, who are out there. And if you're the candidate, they can't coordinate with you, and they don't coordinate with you. And in fact, in some cases, they can hurt you. They can go off and do an ad against your opponent that you wouldn't do. I mean, so we've lost the continuity, and the two parties have, and the gerrymandering has had a lot to do with that also with the parties. That's one of the things that our group is studying here in my, my focus group, that you've lost the middle in both parties. So you, you don't have moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats anymore. Uh, the Democrats tend to be a leftist party, we tend to be a conservative party. And you need the middle to, 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 to make deals, to be able to, to, to uh, say, all right, I'll give you this, I'll give you that, let's get this bill passed, and so forth, and that's missing. A lot of other things that are missing. But, so I, I really believe that the party structure has changed dramatically. The job of a, a chairman of the party, Republican or Democrat, has changed, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure, I, I'm, I, willing to bet you Debbie Wasserman Schultz has not sat in the cabinet room with the president and vice president and the leaders of the cabinet because the president doesn't call cabinet meetings, this president doesn't call cabinet meetings very often, or the leadership of the, of the House and Senate because he doesn't meet with them. So it's, it's a change dynamic and I think that the campaign reform has had rather than the positive effect that the people wanted to get yeah, it's really turned out to be the opposite. Yeah. And just to wrap things up, yes. if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about your study group here at the IOP this semester. The, the study group here at the IOP is, is to, across party lines. So my challenge to, to my, my focus group is what existed in the 80s 
where we could do that across party lines, which is missing in this current, but where nothing is done, where deadlock is there. And how has society changed? Maybe it's not maybe just what's missing, but what's new been added to it. So we're focusing, we've already focused on gerrymandering. Uh, today we're going to focus on the role of the media. There was not a Fox News and an MSNBC back in those days, uh, where, which takes very hard sides. And, and, and Phil, having run CNN, uh, is going to tell us you know, th that, that history. We're going to uh, look at some things like um, open primaries, where there's no Republican and Democratic primary. We're going to look at early voting. Uh, I'm bringing in uh, former Senator Bai from Indiana, Evan, who has two sons, a freshman here. Uh, they're freshmen here at, at Harvard. And one of them goes with my granddaughter, who's at Notre Dame. <laughs> so Senator Bai is going to come in, because he, he resigned in frustration getting nothing done, as did Olympia Snow, a very good Republican senator. And we're going to talk about what it was like and what, what he's given a lot of thought. How can we change these things and hopefully reach ground where we can get across party lines and get something done for the American people? That's where I'm going. Great. Thank you so much All for right? talking with us. All righty.